Northwest. How are you doing this morning? My name is Aslan, and this is my husband, David. We are just two of the pastors that are on rotation to speak here. So if this is your first time, it's nice to meet you. And we thought today we would tag team teach just to change it up, to do something different. So that's what we're going to do today. So I'll do the first half of the teaching, and then David will switch with me, and he'll do the second half. This month, we've been in a series talking about the supernatural. Now, if, you're, if this is your first time, if you're new here, or maybe you're not even, don't even consider yourself religious, I recognize that the supernatural is something kind of strange to talk about. It's even strange to those of us who are Christians, because it's beyond what you can see with your eyes. So I just want to encourage you, if you're new, if it's your first time, just relax. And if some of this seems kind of strange, well, guess what? It is. <laughs> but we believe that it's true. So we're going to get started. The difficulty with doing a series is that you feel like you want to go back and review the previous teachings when it's your turn to speak because they were so good and they build up to what we're about to talk about. So if this is your first week of this month, I encourage you to go back and listen to the sermons that we've already had. They're kind of building up to what we're talking about today. But so far we've talked about how to be ready for the move of God in our life. And we talked about how there is a spiritual battle going on that we cannot see. And then last week, Pastor Mark talked about how to speak the language of faith and how faith and, and the things that we speak activate the supernatural of God within us. So this week, we're going to talk about our part, our weapons and our strategies that we use in the supernatural in this battle. So to begin, I want to talk about two errors regarding Satan that even Christians fall into. So this is how we're going to get started today. So we tend to either underestimate Satan or overestimate him. So for underestimating, what I'm referring to is there are even Christians out there that don't really believe in Satan. They're like, eh, that's going too far to, to me to believe in the bad guy out there or some demonic evil thing. And then if you're not a Christian then, and you're sitting here, you might be like, yeah, I think to believe in the demonic or Satan or demons, that seems way too crazy to me. But let me just give you two things to consider if maybe you fall on the side of underestimating Satan. One thing, first thing to consider, consider that you might be a little bit simplistic in your thinking. Now, in 2017, we like to be nuanced, right? We like to be sophisticated. We don't like to think that we're being crude or unsophisticated in our thinking. But consider that by not considering a spiritual dimension to human evil, you may be simplistic in your thinking. Because listen, racism, murder, poverty, crime, child abuse, the natural and scientific reasonings behind that are starting to wear thin, right? Now, there are definitely factors, psychological factors, sociological factors, and yes, they do contribute to things like lack of education, bad parenting, no access to social programs. Those are definitely factors that make things like racism, poverty, crime worse and happen. But to say that that's the only thing behind evil, I believe is simpli it's too simplistic. We need to be more nuanced in our thinking, in our consideration of why evil exists. How could a person spray bullets into a crowd, murdering hundreds of people? And the second thing to consider, if you underestimate, if you don't believe in Satan, is that you might be culturally narrow. That one feels bad, really bad, doesn't it? We don't want to be culturally narrow, but consider... That it's really a white Western thing. White Western people have a problem with the idea of a spiritual realm, right? Because Latin America, Asia, Africa, they have no problem believing, and they do believe in another realm, in a spiritual world, in the demonic. And so really, it's a white Western thing to be like, please, you know, I don't believe in spirit, spirits and things like that. But just consider that. You might be culturally narrow if you think that way. 
Are we really saying that our culture holds all wisdom and those cultures, most of the world knows nothing, has no wisdom in that area? That would be quite a statement to make. So <clears throat> just consider that. And so the second extreme that we go to with Satan is some people overestimate Satan, right? And it's like everything becomes Satan. You stub your toe and you're like, Satan's out to get me. <laughs> or you're looking for like, you're thinking like the exorcist is going to happen at every turn. Like he's demon possessed, she's demon possessed. Okay, so there's an error in doing that too because you're going to miss the way that Satan is primarily attacking you. The main way Satan attacks us is by lies and deception. His name means to slander, to accuse, and to defame. That's what his name means. That's what the devil means in the Greek, to slander, to accuse. And so if you're looking for, you know, a, a demon possession at every corner or thinking he's behind things like that, you're going to miss how he's really attacking your life, and that's to lie to you. All right, so it may surprise you that we do not have professionals building our props for us. <laughs> Shocking, I know, uh, once you see this great example here. But, and, and the band gave us a crazy hard time about this because uh, they did not understand. Okay, so imagine this is the top of a piano. So I've opened the lid of a grand piano, uh. and you're looking down. Oh, everyone's like, ah. The band's like, it's a harp. It's a harpsichord. I'm like, all right, back off. We did this yesterday in our garage. I think he did a great job. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, so, so there's an author. His name is John White, and he wrote a book called The Christian's um, Guide to something. <laughs> and <laughs> it's a great read. <laughs> Uh, and he described how Satan attacks us as this, how he lies to us. He, he said, if you, this is true, if you open a piano, if you open the lid of a piano, and if you have perfect pitch, okay, not happening here, but if you did, and you sang a note, pretend I'm singing a note, because that's not going to happen either. <laughs> Whatever note you were singing, that particular string would vib will vibrate if you do that. So... He describes the enemy as this, that he whispers in your ear lies and aggravates the sin that is already in your heart. That's how he operates. That's the battle that we're in. That the, the way that he whispers, let's say it's rejection, right? Let's say your parents got divorced, your dad wasn't in your life, or for, your divorce, whatever it is. Rejection is something that you battle in your heart. Here comes his whisper to vibrate. See, they don't really love you. That person is going to leave you, just like your dad left. Everyone would be better off if you just weren't here anymore. See, you didn't get that promotion because you are a failure. And he's whispering those lies into your heart and vibrating what is already in there. The sin or the hurt that already exists in our heart. See, because the devil doesn't come. We don't believe, as Christians, we don't believe we're inher born inherently good, right? No, we're born into sin. So the devil doesn't take an inherently good person and make him evil. He takes a flawed person and makes him worse. And he lies and he slanders and he gets you to believe things that are not true to aggravate and agitate and vibrate those strings in your heart and mind. And so that is how the enemy operates. So we're going to go back two weeks ago. Pastor Peter talked, read Ephesians and, and preached on this passage. And so we're going to go to the little bit, the portion he didn't specifically speak on and finish this chapter out. So it says, stand, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. When do we put on the armor of God? So when do we do it? Here we see it says... Stand therefore, 
having. The verbs in this passage are past actions that are completed, meaning you don't wait to put on your armor once the battle's already raging, right? There's no logic in that. Even if you think of an army, they wouldn't just walk around, wait for the first shots to be fired, and be like, all right, cool, hold on. Let me go get suited up. Let me get my helmet. Let me get my gun. No, you suit up. You get the armor on before the battle begins. But the problem that we have is that when things are going good in our lives, we don't, we don't feel like we're in any real battle. There hasn't been a major failure or major struggle. We spiritually coast, right? That's what we do. So when we spiritually coast, it means we, maybe we don't read our Bible as much. We stop praying as often. Maybe we lighten up our church and small group attendance because things are good. We don't feel that we're in any battle or any struggle. But then the arrows start to come. Then a battle starts raging. Then you start reading your Bible more. Then you start praying more. Then you go back to small group and you're like, guys, I need you to pray with me. But it's too late. It's too late at that point. Why? Why is it too late? Because the armoring of your soul takes time. The fortifying of your soul takes time. When we, when we spiritually coast when things are easy, we're not filling our soul. We're not fortifying ourselves to be ready for when the battle comes. So you may think like, I just struggle. I struggle to read instead of watching Netflix. Or I struggle to get up early enough to pray. Or these little dis disciplines, they just, I don't know, it seems nitpicky. It seems like our pastors are just nitpicking us to like do all these little deeds. That's fine. You don't have to do them. That doesn't mean you're not a Christian. But it does mean your soul is not armored. It's not fortified. And then when failure comes, temptation comes, trial comes, it's overwhelming to us, isn't it? Think, I can't get past this. How can I, how can I make it through this? Because we haven't armored our soul. We haven't been doing the things that help us be strong in battle. So let me give you two examples. Because if you think, okay, well, if it's a struggle for everyone to spiritually coast when it's easy, then how can we? How can we put our armor on? When do we do that? I'll give you two examples of a battle that you most likely face every single day that is an opportunity for you to win that battle and practice putting on your armor. One temptation that you face every single day is impatience, right? Impatience with people. So you're driving along, someone cuts you off in traffic. What happens? What does your heart say? <laughs> what are the heart thoughts at that moment? right? Idiot. <laughs> Stupid. Imbecile. Okay. That right there is a battle. That right there shows where your heart is at. When you're impatient with people and you start having that self-talk inside, gosh, look at her. No wonder that happened to her. She's always, that's a battle. Now, what we could do, what could we do in those moments? We could realize the thoughts we're thinking, we could stop and we could say, God, I bet I look like this to you. I bet I look like this to you. Uh, you. When you were in the garden about to die, you asked your friends to stay awake and pray with you, and they couldn't. They kept falling asleep, and yet you were patient with them. So I'm going to be patient. But do we do that? No. We think, idiot, stupid, frustrated, and your heart gets a little bit harder and you become a little bit more proud, and you just lost the opportunity to fight in a little battle, to be aware of what your heart is saying, what your intentions are saying, to fortify you. Another example, worry. Probably every single day you have the opportunity to fight this battle. You know what worry is? Worry is saying, I know exactly how this day ought to go, and God might not get it right. So I'm going to take over. I'm going to worry. That's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to say, no, I'm not going to worry. I'm going to be at peace. I'm going to trust that whatever comes today, God has strengthened me to get through it. But we don't do that. And our heart becomes a little bit more anxious, a little bit more hardened, a little bit less faith. And so those are examples 
of how every day, even in the times when we're good, when we're spiritually coasting, you need to tune in to that battle that's happening, the thoughts that are happening in your heart to practice putting on that armor. Amen. Well done, my queen. So now we're to the point of what does it mean to put on the armor? And something to notice here in Ephesians is he's talking to Christians that already have these things. He's not saying, hey, by the way, Ephesians, I have these new tools for you to try. They already have the armor. They have it in their possession. It's theirs. The, the uh, righteousness, the salvation, the peace, faith, all these things belong to those who call on Christ as Savior. Those are yours. And so if you're the church at Ephesus, Paul is saying, time to put it on. Activate it. Make it happen. You can do that. This is a, an opportunity where we get to move from the information of having these things and having this armor to the transformation that happens to the heart once the armor is on and has been used and activated for a little while. So what, what Paul is saying is he's saying, I want you to take these truths into yourself so that when you're criticized, when you fail, when trial comes, you're not shaken to the point where you're questioning everything. Instead, you have this ability to feel as an infinitely loved and safe person. That's what he means, that's what he wants, that's the effect that the armor has when we do put it on. To put on the armor means to take what is objectively true of you as a Christian, that you have these things, and to make it subjectively your reality. So to take it from this information point to a place where you've been transformed, where you know these things, where you move in these things, that's the goal. All of us struggle in this, but that's the goal. So now that we see generally what it means to put on the armor, now we go into the how. And this is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time. The how of putting on the armor, we've categorized it into three general sections that we're going to lump a couple of these bits of armor into. And there are seven if you count prayer as part of the armor. So let's look at the first one that's up on the screen, the foundation, which would be the belt of truth. And in Greek, the word belt does not mean this inch and a half strap of leather that's going around my belt and the rest of you who've put on pants that don't quite fit, you got them on too. So like, that's not what he's talking about. The belt of truth, so referring to armor in that time, it was a full body leather garment, which some of you like, which is weird. You know, I'm not into that. But it's a full body leather garment that went down to the thighs. And this went on before any of the other bits of armor. It's the foundation. So when we look at this, the metaphor is saying, the metaphor of the belt of truth is saying, let the general truth of what God is saying so richly live in your hearts that the, the truth, that truth is at the center of everything that comes after. Truth is primary here. It's the foundation for everything else. A good example of how this was not embraced by the disciples and maybe some of us is if you remember in Matthew chapter 8, where the disciples get into a boat with Jesus and then the storm just erupts around them and Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is doing what the Prince of Peace does best and having peaceful sleep during a hurricane, you know? So like, he's asleep, they're all freaking out, they're, they're, they're losing their minds and they begin to panic and they go to him and they wake him up and this is what they say. They say, Master, we're gonna die. So, take a step back. God comes in the flesh and is in a boat with you and you're gonna panic. Information, like when I sit there and I think about it, I'm like, these idiots, God was there. They had the information, they would even agree with me that God was in the boat with them. But their hearts, that doesn't mean that your heart is automatically changed just because he's there in that moment. And so when he wakes up, he rebukes the storm and then his gaze turns to them, okay? So if you ever wanted to like live in the times of Jesus, how about this? Just think about this for a moment. I don't ever want, I don't, I'm glad that I was made in this time. Because I didn't want to have to be in a boat with Jesus with a defective heart and seeing the one who made everything including me go, you failed. You know, like there's something about a personification, like an actual human being saying it, rather than like the Holy Spirit to us, you know, gently calls our hearts into question and rebukes us that way. It's like Jesus is looking at you, he's like, this is God looking at me saying, stop it, you know? That's different, but that's what he does. He rebukes the storm, and then this is what he says. 
This is good. Are you ready? I primed the pump. You want the answer. You could open your Bible and find it, but you're going to listen to me. So after they've said, Master, we're going to die, which basically they're saying, don't you care about us? That's what they're saying. Don't you care? Don't you love us, Jesus? Sweet Jesus, don't you love us? We're going to die and you're just sleeping. It's like not a big deal to you that we perish. He calms the storm and he looks at them and he says, where is your faith? Not that they didn't have any. He didn't, he didn't rebuke them for not having faith. He said, where is it? You're not activating what you have. That's what he's saying to him. He's saying, you have walked with me. You've seen my power. At this point, they have seen him move powerfully. And you've experienced my deep love for you. Yet you ask this? You, you, you question whether or not I can keep you safe? Like, that's what's going on here. And this, when the storm's raging, here's the disciples' hearts. They're listening to another voice instead of the one who created the ability to speak. They're listening to this, and their heart string is vibrating. Panic. Panic. Now, the encouraging thing is, they later become a little bit more rigid, and they they don't shake as much. The disciples, you see, they don't, they don't vibrate. They go to their death for the gospel. So the encouraging thing is, not that we're all gonna die, but that we can get to the place where those strings stiffen, where your heart does not so easily listen to the whisper and move and vibrate. They go solidly forward. So we saw a bad moment for them, but they get better. Thank God for that. That's the foundation, the belt of truth. The next one we're gonna go into is gonna be the routine operation, the routine armor for battle. So what we see with this is that, so the breast, breastplate of righteousness, the shoes, the helmet, and the shield, after we've come away having the foundation of truth settled, once that's there, we've got that general trust in God, now it's time to go into defensive mode. What does that mean? What does that look like? Okay, you wake up, the battle is there. So you may think right now you're, you've got an easy life, you haven't really been sinning a lot, although yeah, you have. And you, you may feel like, you know, there's not a whole lot of trial happening in my family right now, but let's, let's keep one thing in perspective. Your heart is the battleground that Satan will choose to fight on. The, it's not as common that he comes and possesses a person that's, that's, that's not, and not that that doesn't happen, but the, the bulk of his fight against us is quietly attacking the heart. And every day, and you know it, when you wake up, all these thoughts come rushing into your head about the day. Some of them good, some of them very bad, some of them very discouraging, but every day when you wake up, you're moving into battle. And what Paul is saying is when you get up and you start moving and you put on the shoes, which are for traveling, and you put on the breastplate, which is to help protect against darts that come at you, and you put on this helmet, you have to realize defense. Like, these are, these are not offensive weapons. These are defensive apparatus that you put on yourself. And so he's saying you need to activate this, you need to put it on, and be assured that those things are coming. It, we make a big mistake when we think that our thought life and our hearts are not being attacked on a daily, regular, moment-by-moment -moment basis. And that might seem like, oh, you're, you're really starting to make it a little bit more frightening. You know, come on, like, do we really need to be that on guard? Well, yeah, the answer is yes. Because any problem that does come your way didn't just happen out of nowhere. It doesn't just explode from nothing. Out of nothing, nothing comes, you know, like... The, the whole universe that we live in, God spoke it into existence. It came from a non-physical place, didn't it? At least people who think correctly will, think, will go, yes, God, non-physical, spiritual being caused all physical things to take place. And we lie to ourselves when we think that some of the struggles we have in our lives are not spiritually, behind the scenes, unseen, causing some of the frustration in your marriage, your home, your, your frustration with your parents, your kids, all of this, there are things at play that you might not be seeing. And if you're not ready and, and have your defensive clothing on, you're in for a hard road. I know this, I've experienced it. The, uh, 
the trouble I had, even, all right, let's take this from a, uh, a new believer to a believer who's been activating their armor for a long time, and, or a relatively long time. So for myself, my personal example of this is when I was a new Christian, I had the information that God loved me and died on the cross for me, but it hadn't come home to live in my heart so much that I wouldn't stop questioning my identity. So when, when, when moments where I felt I had failed and now I'm no longer good for anything, Satan was whispering and my heart would just vibrate hard to that string and that would cause me to go and seek my own medication. And that would cause me to go that little giving into the lie and go, dang it, he died on the cross for me but here I am, I'm a failure and I'm listening and I'm starting to agree with the lie and my heart just starts doing this and then it's going, 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 going and then I'm like, I gotta stop this and I wasn't so prepared with the defensive putting on the armor that I went after things that never filled my heart and only caused worse things. Um, there comes a place where you get tired of living that way. And I hope some of us are tired of not putting the armor on, that you, you become sick of giving in to the lie. And you begin to believe the, the people around you, the community that you have here, which is a, truly a special thing to have. And when you allow what God says, you start to go from this to this and hearing that lie to the place where you cannot be moved and shaken from the truths about who you are. And for me, I began to walk a little taller, not because of who I am and all of what God has made me, but what he has given me. I have become so dead set and settled on the fact that you are all listening to a man who's been adopted into God's royal family. So I can speak with force, I can speak with conviction in all of these things, not because of who I am, but because I believe what he said about me, and you can't take it from me. And I dare people to try. I do that every time I preach. I'm like, come at me, bro. Like, do it. But there was a time when I was a weak little boy in a man's body giving in to this. And I know men far greater than myself who've been walking far longer with their hand in Christ, and you can't shake them, and I love following them. Because one day I'll be so settled in this fight and in this battle because they don't give up the fight. They don't, give it, they don't stop putting the armor on day in and day out. And they're better than me at it and I love that. Because it means I can continue to grow in this. And if you're here today and you're saying, man, I keep on giving into these things, stay in the fight. You may have been unprepared yesterday, but today you'll, you'll walk forward. you go, I'm putting on the defensive armor. I'm not going to let the arrows come and take me out because I know I'm going to have to teach my children this. And I want them to see that their dad, their mother, their uncle, their cousin, their, their grandfather got better and better with age like a fine wine. That's what I want for myself. I want my daughter to see that in me. And I'm not near what I need to be. The final practical, the sword of the spirit. So we've, we've gone from having the foundation of truth to now putting on the defensive armor, and now we get to be offensive once we've been ready for the defense. So this is, it might seem repetitious, but the sword of the spirit and praying in the spirit are different from the belt of truth because this is where you so deeply memorize scripture and you let your, your eyes pour over scripture so much that you now get to see into the battle and you got to strategize. You get to now call things out that you see that weren't so obvious to anyone else. You get to go into battle now and protect others. That's the sword. The sword is being able to speak truth because you so know it, so deeply know it, has become a part of who you are that you can now give it freely, constantly. The worst thing to do is to be so protected but not know how to answer for others. To not be able to get to the place where it goes beyond your just own protection and then move to them. You need to bust out a sword and help a brother out. They're all around you and some of us have the sword sheathed, not drawn. Because we're not reading and we're not praying. These are the two ways you can be offensive and ready for battle. If we neglect our prayer life and we neglect reading the Bible, what are we doing? It's all about us and just trying to stay protected 
That's not loving, that's not flourishing, that's not reaching beyond. Righteousness, peace, and salvation, and faith. Other people don't have it, you need to bring it to them. We're going to close here, but what I want you to do is look at your own heart today. Maybe you haven't really closely examined the kind of lies that come in and say, you're not worthy of it. You failed too many times. You're going to be just like your father. Look at this person over here. They sin so much. They're no better than me, so I can justify it in my life. What is the lie that vibrates the string in your heart? And be honest, because every one of us has one that's a little loose, that listens to that perfect pitch. Satan's been lying for thousands of years, and he's really good at it, and he sees your heart pretty well. He sees your tendencies, and he can get it to do this. Which one is yours? If you'll stand, we're going to pray, and we're going to ask that God would remind us every day that we are in a battle that rages. And though it might be quiet, and we may not recognize it all the time, it is there, and it is the reality that we live with. Father, as these men and women, as we look at our hearts honestly, and we recognize how that, that string vibrates to the lie of the enemy, we ask that you would, while we're putting on armor, be whispering as well into our ears the truths of the gospel that we are yours, that you chose us from all kinds of people, that we have been included in your family, that the lies that Satan speaks regularly to us, they begin to fall flat, that our strings stiffen up and they do not react to his pitch, but they respond in obedience to your wonderful wisdom and your love. Lord, make your people the kind of people that are ready for battle at a moment's notice. They're walking around with all of it on. The foundation of truth, the defensive gear, and we get to the place where we can run into battle and save our brothers and sisters. Lord, we glorify your name. It is you who gives and gives and gives. You give us the strength that we could not have known, a peace that surpasses every storm. Make it true of us. Make it true today. We thank you in Jesus' name.